Well, we're learning more about Qasem Soleimani from a leaked archive of secret Iranian spy cables that were obtained by The Intercept. The documents were generated by officers from the Iranian Ministry of Intelligence and Security stationed in Iraq between 2013 and 2015. That's when the Iranian war against the Islamic State was at its height and Soleimani was running the show. Murtaza Hussein is a writer for The Intercept and he joins us now. He's also the author of a new article detailing how Qasem Soleimani became one of Iran's most powerful generals. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You bet. Well, you say that the, you know, the image emerges uh, of these cables that Soleimani, and I'm quoting here, does not always align with the carefully crafted public image of the general as an indomitable strategist. How so? Well, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. Soleimani was leading the Iranian war against ISIS during the period of these documents. And Mr. Soleimani is known and he's been depicted as a very competent strategist. In some ways, that's true. But within the Iranian government, there were some concerns that the way he was fighting ISIS, while effective, was resulting in some level of blowback. Uh, the brutality of some of the Iranian-backed militias in Iraq in particular were feared by some in Iran to be generating the circumstances that would lead to renewed American military presence in Iraq, which the Iranians do not want, as well as a backlash among Iraqis towards the Iranian presence in their country. You know, I was fascinated. You know, sources that I spoke to over the summer, Israeli sources, had been monitoring Instagram and the images that were put out of him uh, in various areas just over the summer alone. He had a sense of himself, a sense of confidence. And some people say that his aspirations didn't end at his current position, that potentially he wanted to become president. Well, the irony is that Mr. Soleimani had a nickname, especially in the West, of the shadow commander. But he was very much not a shadow commander in the sense that he took great steps to publicize his own role, promote his own role as a warrior against ISIS, as a symbol of Iranian nationalism. And you can see the effects of this promotion in the mass outpouring of uh, grief among Iranians, many of whom are not fans of the regime per se, but he had become this icon of Iranian nationalism. And some had speculated in the past that perhaps uh, his, this promotion of his role was intended to boost his political capital in Iran, potentially to uh, develop a political career in Iran later after his military career. Of course, this question is forever unknown now because Mr. Soleimani has been killed in the strike, but it's something that has been speculated both internally and externally uh, in Iran. You talk a little bit about the metamorphosis of Soleimani, about how he started off as an ideologue and then transformed into this military and intelligence leader. How did he make that transformation? Well, one thing the documents mention, kind of as an aside, it, it compares Mr. Soleimani to other regional figures. And they use specifically the examples of uh, former Turkish Prime Minister Ahmet Davutoglu mm -hmm. and the current Turkish intelligence thief Hakan Faidan. Now, Mr. Soleimani has a very long history in the region as a major political figure. He's well known, has relationships with people in many different countries. And the documents mention he had a very close relationship with Mr. Davutoglu. And at some point in his life, he saw himself as an analog to Mr. Davutoglu, who was for many years the intellectual force behind the current Turkish ruling government. But at the documents, which are from 2014, they mentioned that now Mr. Soleimani's uh, self-perception was switching more to being a proxy warrior, a shadow warrior, an intelligence official like Mr. Fadan is. And of course, these are external evaluations trying to get inside his head. They're not his own direct mm -hmm. thoughts. But it's an interesting image because we do not know how a lot of people in Iran and the Iranian ruling government perceive themselves or each other. And the documents give, however, uh, much of a glimpse into what the reality of that is. You know, you were talking a little bit before we, we started this interview offset, you were saying about how opaque Iran is. Just understanding the inner workings is not very easy and getting documents like this sort of shed some light is what you were saying. How internally, did he have any beef that we know of with folks internally? How was he able to have a command over these Iraqi militia groups? We don't have any indication of uh, necessarily a beef between him and anyone internally. But, you know, it, he developed a reputation for many years. He's a veteran of the Iran-Iraq war. He's one of the original revolutionary generation of the Islamic Republic of Iran. And he rose through the ranks. He developed a very broad following in the regime and evidently in the Iranian public. And he developed a 
reputation as a competent and uh, inspiring commander to Iranians who support Iranian foreign policy, you could say. Mm. So it's unsurprising someone from this generation rose to such a high rank and the results in some way can be seen in the effective waging of the Iranian war against ISIS. Some of the other documents talk about the Iranian support for the Kurdish war against ISIS and the Iraqi government's war against ISIS. And yet there were some concerns that the war perhaps had been a tactical victory which had laid the groundwork for strategic setback for Iran because it had been waged by the Iranian-backed militias in a way which had alienated certain important segments of Iraqi society. So if the U.S. were to completely pull out of Iraq, would Soleimani's major goals have been fulfilled? Well, the irony is the Iraqi government seems to think that the U.S. is leaving and seems to have been some miscommunication, and the United States government is insisting that they would like to stay. Now, the United States not, today is not an occupying power in Iraq. It is there by the invitation of the Iraqi government. If the Iraqis tell them to leave and say that in respect of our sovereignty, you must withdraw, if the United States removes, if re refuses to accede to that request, it will effectively become an occupying power in Iraq with great implications. Now, you know, if Mr. Soleimani's main goal in recent years was to evict the United States military presence from Iraq, they feel that the U.S. in Iraq is a threat to them, and they do not want a situation where the United States is propping up an Iraqi political order which can become a threat to Iran the way Saddam Hussein was in the 80s. So if they end up leaving, Mr. Soleimani in death will have achieved a goal he did not accomplish in life. But as yet, it's unclear if that will be the outcome of this. Murtaza Hussein, fascinating reporting. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.